and we're rolling. Yeah. There you go. Um, well, we're in Tanya Plibersek's mum's house and it is lovely. Except for that horrific painting there. But apart from that, <laughs> look, it's not because it's it's not because it's not a bad painting, right? Like it's yeah. a very lovely painting. But as your brother pointed out, no wait, you pointed out, that's a picture of Dorian Gray right there. Yeah, yeah, it is. The painting's <laughs> getting older and I'm staying young. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's too that. Oh, oh thank, you, bro. Yeah. thank you. Oh. Thank you. It's delicious. <laughs> yummy, yummy. Yeah, better start. Don't get hungry. Okay. Thanks, Mum. <laughs> <laughs> that was really nice. Look, we saw you make it as well. She did this little magic trick where she just pulled the, you know, the tablecloth off. That's film. nice, isn't it? Did you film that? That's no. really cool. Did we? Yes, we did. All there right. you go. Well, we're going to eat and we'll be back in a sec. Huh. That's so nice. So we just start again and just yeah. feel, all right. Well, that was lovely, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Sorry. <laughs> Honestly, I can't take you anywhere. <laughs> is this old? It's old, isn't it? It came from the old country. She's yeah. shocked. She I feel bad. Dude, you came in. She just fed us nice, I don't know, Slovenian dessert. And this is how I repay you. I'm sorry, Mum. <laughs> I really am. I didn't know he would be like this. <laughs> Well, I guess um, we'll yep, just put we that there and... Yeah. Uh... Well, you grew up in this house, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Well, we lived the first few years um, at a house nearby, like a couple of kilometres away, but we moved here when I was about four. Yeah, my parents built it, actually. Really? Yeah. Well, with their own bare hands. Well, yeah, actually, a lot of it. My my mum carried bricks. Uh, my my dad did a lot of the work on it. He's a plumber, and um, it was designed by a family friend. And uh, yeah, they did a lot of the work. What is with Yugoslavs and being into hard labour? Well, Just always doing stuff. I heard that your mum, for instance, during the drought, used to go across the park. It's, you know, just across the road over there. And water the trees. Yeah, my dad, he'd actually get these two huge buckets and fill them up at our tap and walk across and water them because there wasn't, there wasn't a hose down there. Um, the council wouldn't put a tap in for him. <laughs> so he just used to... He just, just to punish used to, Yeah, he just used to water them. You can't talk, Mum. <laughs> <laughs> She's heckling. <laughs> Take two. She's not moving. <laughs> That's stubborn. <laughs> that is. <laughs> there is a reason that my mother has survived as long as she has. She doesn't take orders from anyone. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Just a defiant thing now? Is that the? Yeah. yeah okay. So All right. The oppositional defiance disorder. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Do you, you don't have that streak at all, though, do you? Because in school you were just a very pliant teacher's pet. Uh, well, I wasn't definitely, I was definitely a teacher's pet, I think. I'd, I, I was very studious and very serious uh, and I actually really liked my teachers. I had really nice teachers. Um, but, I, yeah, pretty stubborn as well. Um, Did you yeah. get in trouble for it? No, not really. I mean, I, I was always kind of stubborn about, about the the right things, I suppose. Like, for example, at the end of primary school, we had this big um, argument that the year sixes were saying, why should girls and boys have separate playgrounds? And there were teachers really were kind of going, yeah, it's a bit dumb, isn't it? So it was, I was stubborn about the right things. Come on, you must have pegged a rock at a car or something. Uh, I smoked for a while as a teenager. Are you serious? Yeah, oh. that's probably one of the things I'm most embarrassed about. It's <laughs> such a dumb thing to do, and uh, it was just entirely peer group pressure. And I, I'm really, I'm embarrassed now. Yeah. What? So it was some cooler girl at school that was being like, "Come on, Tanya, you want to go to the party, don't you?" Uh, well, it, it wasn't. No, it wasn't any one person. It just, you know, when we were when we the, were kids, was the there rage. was still a lot of advertising, cigarette advertising, yeah. and. I used to smoke Alpine Lights, which were really targeted at girls, for sure. Sounds it. Yep. Uh, did your mum know? 
She busted me a few times. <laughs> I got in big trouble. <laughs> I gave my... I had my pocket money cut. I got grounded. <laughs> I was, yeah, I got in big trouble. Yep. Well, that's nice to know that she was, you know, fine with it. Because I just imagine that back then everyone just would have been like, smoking's good for you, right? Like, that's just I'm, like I'm brushing not, your teeth. Seriously, not that old. <laughs> you just were <laughs> talking to me as though I was smoking in the 1940s. <laughs> this is like the 80s, okay, not the 40s. <laughs> we knew that smoking was bad for you. Well, I, I, look, I don't know, really know the timeline. I just thought that, like, you know, right up until the 90s, everyone was kind of just like yeah. this open-ended. It was, it was it was the climate change debate of then, right? Not really. I mean, seriously, knew, in the 80s, knew. everybody knew smoking was bad for you. <laughs> and um, But it was also cool. That's yeah, why it, it kind of was right. cooler than it was now. And actually one of the things that I'm proudest of from when I was health minister was really getting smoking rates down. How and did you do that? The plain packaging? Plain packaging was one thing. Um, advertising campaigns, uh, reminding people how bad smoking is. Apps that help you gave, uh, give up. So you could download an app that would tell you how much money you were saving, how much better your health was. Um, funding like uh, primary health care campaigns, for example, in Aboriginal communities, making sure you have targeted campaigns for specific communities, non-English speaking background communities. Um, but and And frankly, increasing the cost. I mean, there's a really strong correlation between the cost of smoking and people giving up. And this is one of the reasons that I'm so disappointed. I thought the government was going to ban the importation of nicotine vaping um, paraphernalia. And uh, it looked like Greg Hunt was going to do it. And then he backed down uh, under pressure from people on his own side. And everybody knows vaping is a way of getting kids hooked on nicotine and it's a gateway to smoking. So this bullshit argument that it's going to help people give up is not true. Uh, there's teenagers now who are vaping who would never think of smoking because teenagers have got that it's disgusting and bad for you. It, it just breaks my heart that the big tobacco companies think, oh, all our old customers are dying. What can we do to develop a new customer base? Let's target vaping at kids. Yeah. What you just said is going to be really unpopular on the net, I can tell you right now. I don't care. No, that's awesome. I'm glad that you're saying it, but I was just saying, could you just go a little further into this? Because, look, I'm, I'm scared of it. Just look, that's, that's your opinion, not mine. <laughs> you know, like, if you could just go into the, if you could just, if you could just unpack for us a little more why vaping, uh, you know, the, the, the health risks of it, because I, th I think you'd be doing a public service if you did I, that. All right, so... The reason that um, the reason that uh, some alcoholic drinks are sweet flavoured and don't taste like alcohol is because kids don't like the taste of alcohol. We'll get them drinking sweet soft drinks, and then they start, you know, moving into other types of alcohol. Vaping, fruit flavoured vape, uh, um, fruit flavoured vaping is. Uh, the it does next, taste better than beach, yeah. It, and, and then you go, and then you go. Uh, okay, some has nicotine, some doesn't. I'm going to try the stuff with nicotine. Oh, I'm addicted to nicotine. Um, I can't always be vaping. Maybe I'd like to try smoking. It's a, it's just a um, really obvious path to get a new customer base. This is big multinational tobacco companies that have had their markets undermined. Because their customers keep dying, now saying, where do we find our next lot of customers? And it, it really breaks my heart that um, a lot of teenagers think that it's cool. I mean, how dumb is it to give people money to make you sick? See, look, the, the argument that I'm always seeing from think tanks that are clearly funded by tobacco companies, take what you will from that. <laughs> um, they always say that it reduces the amount of people smoking because it gives them a healthier alternative. So is there evidence to support that or? I call bullshit. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I think that's probably the right move. So seriously, 13% of Australians smoke now. We've been getting that number down, the, the proportion down, year after year after year. And the least likely people to smoke were teenagers. Uh, if you didn't start smoking by the age of 21, you were likely never to smoke. Mm. So we've got this group of people who we've successfully convinced that smoking is bad for you. In fact, it kills you. And by the way, it's expensive too. 
that it's a dumb thing to do, but, oh, we've got this new product that appeals to them. It, it just is heartbreaking. Yeah. Especially when you're a tobacco company, you've got all the money in the world. Why don't you just invest in shapes? You know? Like just <laughs> something else. Well, Why they're pretty wanna... addictive too, shapes. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Look, I'm really glad that you said that and thank you for it. But uh, you're also the Minister for Education, aren't you? I am. Well, the Shadow, the Minister. Shadow Minister. You wish you were the Minister for Education. Yeah, yeah I kind of do, yeah. Does that eat you up inside? Uh, no, because we live in a democracy and I, I'm, you know, I, I'm um, resigned to the fact that we lost the last election. I wish I was the Education Minister, um, but we, we didn't win, so I'm not. So I have to work harder for next time and make sure that we're ready to govern. Were you really sad on the day or were you kind of like Albo just being like, yeah, I kind of expected this should happen? Like, were, you, were you like uh, very shocked at the result? Uh, I was nervous right through the campaign and, mm. um, and the only time I really thought, oh, yeah, okay, that looks good, is about six o'clock when the first exit polls came out and there'd been a 3% swing towards us and that was enough for us to win. Uh, and then as the night progressed, it became apparent that that swing was not consistent and it was er eroding um, as, as I watched. And it was a pretty hard, oh, pretty hard man. night. Yeah. So Ugh, I, I, it's I, like a I NRL really grand think... final except in slow motion. Yeah. It's over like hours. Yeah. And, you know, I'm a... Um, I'm a nervous campaigner anyway. Like I always <laughs> think we're behind... Even in 2007... Uh, you know, when Kevin won that yeah. very strong victory, yeah. I was nervous right through the campaign. It wasn't until well and truly into the night that I was prepared to go, okay, we've won this. Right. Do you think that you're ever going to lose your seat? Do you, do you, is that like just yeah, a little thought I, in the back of your mind every I, time there's an election? I worry every time. Of course I do. But not just at election time. Like I, I, oh, sorry. Um, I didn't break it at least. No, <laughs> I <laughs> know. You're very polite. Um, <laughs> I, I, I treat my seat like it's a marginal seat and that means campaigning all the way through. It means making sure that you're available to your constituents. It means uh, being visible in the electorate. So uh, it's a bit strange during the COVID lockdown period, but when it's not like this, we do street stalls and market stalls and um, lots of events where people can talk to me on the weekends just to make sure that if they want to raise issues with me, they can. Right. So you're basically the opposite of a Nationals MP. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I, there's, a, there's been a few nice ones over the years. I've got a, a few old friends in the National Party. I like, I like those old country gentlemen sometimes. I do like the fact they wear hats. Yeah. Um, that's more of that is yeah. the only thing that I can add to that. I, I was just assuming that you were going to be mean to them. So no, no, no. no. I, I, there's some of them that I like, um, and over the years there's been quite a few that I like. Uh, but I, it doesn't mean that I always agree with their policies. And I think um, I or think ever? I don't think you agree on anything. Uh, I'm strangely some of the Nats. Uh, actually, if you ask them, for example, some of them are campaigning at the moment for an increase um, to New Start or Job Seeker, as it's now called, because they know that if you increase funding that goes directly to the poorest people, that's really good for regional economies because people spend money in their local community. You increase New Start or Job Seeker, if that's what we're supposed to call it now, and that money, you know, the extra. 20 bucks, 50 bucks, 100 bucks a week goes to the local shops. It creates work for other people in the local community. So that's a really good example of where you'll find agreement. Damn nationals. Yeah. Always pork barreling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, some of them I'd say are probably a little on the um, extreme climate change denier um, scale for me that I'd find that very difficult to deal with. And... One of the other disappointments, I suppose, is when the National Party hasn't stopped cuts to education or cuts to health because rural and regional communities are disproportionately affected. If you cut needs-based funding to public schools, it's rural communities 
small schools, remote schools that really feel that. And um, and it it's not right that they didn't stand up for their school kids. Yeah, I because I lived in a, this town called Lithgow for a while, and this was while Godski funding was going through it. And th- these are the lowest of socioeconomic status that there is in the country, right? It is like way down the totem pole. And I can't remember the exact stats, but it was something along the lines of most people that were graduating year 12 uh, were finishing in like the bands threes and four. After Gonski, I think it was something along the lines of 80% of the kids graduating were getting five and six. Yeah. Look- and th- these are poor kids. I mean, there's a red rooster in that town to give you an idea. <laughs> I'm <laughs> not sure what that means, but uh, needs-based funding works. So if you give extra money to the poorest schools, you give teachers the opportunity to have one-on-one time with kids. It means that they can find the kids who are falling behind and help them catch up. It means if kids have... Uh, a, a disability, uh, a, any sort of learning difficulty, or, or if they're gifted and talented, you can spend the time with them to help them make the most of their gifts. And we know that children from disadvantaged families or in disadvantaged communities often start school uh, behind their peers. Um, I've, I've had teachers tell me that they they see kids who don't know, like they open a book and they don't know whether it's the black bit you look at or the white bit. Like they they don't know how to use scissors because their their um, gross motor skills and fine motor skills are underdeveloped. Really? If you can if you can get in early yeah. with kids who are disadvantaged in some way, you can change their whole life trajectory. That's why education is such an exciting portfolio because you really genuinely can change people's lives if yeah. you get it right. Yeah. And what's the window frame? Sorry, what's the uh, well. Y- if, if kids don't have the basics by age eight, they often struggle to catch up. So you, you can help them catch mm. up, but it, it becomes much harder. The older the children get, the, um, the harder, bigger and more expensive the intervention is that's needed. But if you're working with kids, even before they start school, that's why having um, preschool for three-year-olds as well as four-year-olds and, and also working with families, like because... A child's parents are most often their first educator. If you've been brought up in difficult circumstances yourself, um, it, it can be, you know, you see intergenerational trauma in families, for example. If you can work with that family when their children are little to make the parents confident first educators of their children, you, you change that family and you change the life of that child. And I'd I just think it's such a fantastic investment because you you change the life of the individual person, but you also, you you change our prosperity as a nation. We we invest in education for the individual benefit to the person, but that investment also benefits all of us. If we want to be a prosperous, successful 21st century nation that invents and discovers things and commercialises them and sells them to the world, the best way we can do that is invest in education because our productivity as a nation has been sliding, our our labour productivity has been sliding. Um, there's There's a solution to that that starts with little children. Yeah. You're like this nation's mum, aren't you? It's pretty cool. Three, three is enough. I don't know what I'd do with 26 minutes. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> imagine yeah, you're the, an insect. Imagine the yeah. fights at bedtime. <laughs> How would you choose? Who got to watch their program on TV? Yeah, you, well, there you go. You'd have to do a, a bloody a postal vote for it. Yeah. Yeah. I guess, yeah. Have you... Uh, I, I, I will go back to Gornsky and... His, uh, actually, no, nah, we're talking about it now. How did the Liberals mess that up? Uh, well, they <laughs> how did they mess it up? <laughs> um, they capped the share of funding that came from the Commonwealth government, and that meant that the poorest states, like Tasmania, like the Northern Territory, were getting less funding for their kids. Um, they also essentially, I, mean, I don't want to tell the whole story over again, but we ca- when Labor campaigned against their funding cuts, so. The 2014 budget, the horror budget that Joe Hockey and Tony Abbott said lifters and leaners, right? They basically cut $30 billion out of education. Yeah. So yeah. instead of funding growing 
you know, like this. It, it still grew a bit and they kept saying it's still growing, but it grew like this instead of like this. <laughs> um, and their own budget papers showed that it was a $30 billion cut, but it hit public schools the hardest and yeah. it hit the poorest states the mm, hardest. Mm. Now, we campaigned hard against that. They, they fixed the cuts for Catholic and independent schools, but they never fixed the cuts for public schools. So public schools where the bulk of our children from poorer families, poorer communities, bulk of kids with a disability, bulk of Indigenous kids go to public schools, they never got their funding sorted. So mm. I'd say the, the short answer to how they stuffed it is um, that they have continued a system where the gap between what happens for the richest kids and what happens for the poorest kids gets wider and wider. Yeah. And this is the main point that I wanted to ask you. What do you think the opportunity cost has been for Australia just by the Liberals being elected for the last seven years and doing exactly what you're talking about, which is just systematically defunding public schools and yeah. universities in TAFE. Yeah. I think TAFE got it the hardest, right? All right. So with schools, our results keep going backwards. Uh, like you look at all the international testing, our results keep going backwards. That's just the simplest illustration of the problem. Um, with TAFE, they've cut $3 billion from TAFE and training. We've got 140,000 fewer apprentices and trainees than when the Liberals were elected. And what does that look and like we, well, it, in, the, in the community when we, that... Well, it looks like um, it, it, it looks like a young unemployed person who can't get a traineeship or an apprenticeship. It, it, you can be like I was in a town in northern Tasmania uh, last year, and the local butcher was telling me how hard it was for him to, to find an apprentice because TAFE had been cut, so there wasn't any there wasn't anywhere they could do their training. He, he wanted to hire a, a butcher, but he couldn't find a trained butcher. And there's youth unemployment in that town in the high teens. So you, but that kid can't get the traineeship, can't get the TAFE education, and the employer can't find the staff they need. So three quarters of Australian businesses say they can't find the trained staff they need. Whoa. Even before... COVID-19, we had close to 2 million Australians who were out of work or wanted more hours of work. Mm. We had 140,000 fewer apprentices and trainees. Right now, during COVID-19, we're losing apprentices and trainees at the rate of 2,000 a week. And we've got youth unemployment that's going through the roof. So last month alone, 100,000 young people joined the unemployment queue. We lost 2,000 apprentices and trainees a week. And we made it harder and more expensive to get into university. Like we have this absolute nightmare scenario on our hands where there will be some young unemployed people today who will not work for years. They might not work for decades. What we saw in the 1990s recession is that some people who lost their jobs during that recession never worked again. And we can we can reduce the impact of that now by making sure that we've got enough apprentices and trainees, that w if the Commonwealth Government is funding a new road or bridge or building or whatever, why aren't we insisting on apprentices and trainees on that work site? If we're funding aged care or childcare or the health system, why aren't we ensuring that we have apprentices and trainees, for example, in childcare and aged care, disability services, they're all areas where we could be um, investing to see employment growth, uh, we could be insisting that there's a workforce plan where the employers, the unions, TAFE work together to make sure that we're training people to, to fill those jobs. We actually had an extraordinarily high number of people on temporary visas filling those employment gaps last year. So, you know, um, chefs, hairdressers, uh, a whole lot of jobs that are, you know, yeah, they're hard work, but they're good jobs. We filled them with temporary skilled migrants from overseas because we weren't training Australians to do them. It, it's the same in the health workforce. We've got people who study nursing who can't get a traineeship. You know, they can't do their, their um, you know, final year in a hospital, so they're finding it hard to get a job. Like We are wasting the talents of our people. Yeah. 
What's their game plan? Why are they trying to deliberately make Australians stupider so people vote for them? Well, I, I don't understand it. I, I yeah. think one of the most important responsibilities of a government is to make sure that our kids and our grandkids inherit a better country and a better world. And I, I just see all this stuff that they do that is making the country poorer in the long run. And, yeah, and like the skills shortage is scary. So essentially it shortage. seems like they're saying to everybody, like, uh, you know, go go on the dial and get a job. And it's like, yeah, can I have the training for it? No. So what are you supposed to do? Just sit in a corner. Well, I think, um, you know, when Scott Morrison, at the beginning of the COVID-19 thing, he started saying people who are unemployed through no fault of their own. And really what he was saying is that the two million people who are unemployed or underemployed before COVID-19 were kind of there because it was their own fault. And I think for a government that's cut $3 billion from TAFE and training, uh, billions from universities, it, it's a pretty irresponsible thing to say. I, I, I think um, most people want to work. And uh, during the global financial crisis, for example, one of the things we did was really focus on some of the areas of really um, high disadvantage. We have very high rates of unemployment, for example. And... We did this really good um, program where if you were long-term unemployed, um, you'd get a guaranteed place in TAFE and a guaranteed job placement afterwards. But you'd also get social support. So if you couldn't afford childcare, you'd get um, you know help with childcare while you're at TAFE and what, when you started your job. If you couldn't drive, you know if you lived in the country and there's no bus service to the local TAFE or the job, we'd, they'd help you get your driver's license and stuff. Hmm. Um, one of the people who was running that program rang me when the Liberals stopped the program in the horror 2014 budget and said, she gave me this example, this family, where the mum did the program and she got a job at the local supermarket afterwards and she liked it so much she got a husband to do the program. He got two job offers and, and they were both working and um, it was the first time either of them had had a job and they were able to save up and take their kids on their first ever family holiday. And the really important thing they said was that they it changed the way they were able to support their two sons to complete their education and think about what an employer is looking for to give you a job. So you, you essentially end in intergenerational disadvantage um, by intervening at a time to give some, you know, to give someone an opportunity of an education and a job, mm. you don't just change their lives. You change their sons' lives, their grandchildren, their great grandchildren. Mm. You change the community that they're part of because mm. if they're earning money, they're spending it in their local community. Like that, that is, that's what we should be thinking about at a time like this, as our, as our economy. Um, we hope, begins to rebuild after this immediate health crisis. We have to be thinking, where are the jobs? Where are the good, secure, decently paid jobs that people can, um, you know, buy a car with so they can get to work, that they can get a mortgage or pay the rent, that they can raise their children with a sense of security? That, that has to be our primary focus. And I, I don't... I don't, I, I don't feel like I'm hearing a lot of that from the government at the moment. I don't understand what their bigger picture is. Like, what, what, do, you, what do you think, like, it, it, it seems like they just permanently want Australia to be a giant pit, right? Where it seems like, you know, the, the smart countries like South Korea and Japan and, you know, like the, the East Asian nations, it's like the, their entire economy is driven by education investment. Education, research and development and commercialisation of what we discover and invent. Like and really, they've just cut heaps of jobs from the CSIRO, they've, they've right? Cut, they've cut the CSIRO, they've cut funding for research and development. The universities be, used to use the money that they generated from international students to cross-subsidise research in universities, so that's gone. Yeah. And, uh, um, you know, at our long-term prosperity uh, dep depends on that. You know, our long-term yeah. prosperity depends on it. And I think actually their, their sort of economic theory is if um, rich people and big businesses do well enough, that money flows down to, the, you know, the rest of the economy. Mm. And 
It's not the think, 80s anymore. Well, and, and I think actually the evidence is in that if you, if you see people on lower wages and lower incomes, like the pension, disability support pension, New Start, if they have, if the people on the lowest incomes have an increase in their incomes, they spend it. They spend it and they generate economic activity for other people. It, it's a, it's a um, much better boost to aggregate demand in our economy. If you give people on high incomes a tax cut, they'll pay down their mortgage, they'll, they're much more likely to save it, which good for them. I'm not criticising people for saving. I'm just saying if you want to generate Stimulate economic the economy. activity in our yeah. economy, the, the more money you channel to people on lower incomes, the more, ac uh, the more economic boost you get from that. I really, yeah, you should probably just, okay, oh, now we slipped it over. But I didn't break it. And that's, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna cover up the stain. No, no, it's all right, I'll, I'll try not to gesticulate so much. I don't know, I, I feel uh, your really poor mum, why I, did we do this here? I, I feel so passionate about <laughs> aggregate demand in the economy, like you can't, you gotta forgive me. <laughs> you know, what do you think Australia's future looks like at the current trajectory? I think I think we have a choice. You always have a choice, right? There's yeah. no, there's no, nothing's inevitable. But there's two kind of paths, right? There is a path where we see increasing inequality, where the people at the top who have got secure work will continue to do well. We live in a beautiful country. Life will be good for them but you'll have an increasing underclass of people in insecure work who can't afford housing, who, um, you know, if something happens to them and their income stops for a while, they're really stuffed. Uh, we can, uh, or we can um, go down a path where we make sure that people have decent, secure, well-paid work, where they can afford a roof over their heads, where they feel confident, where they can engage in their community life. You know, they can predict that they're finishing work at five o'clock on Thursday and they can go to soccer training at 6pm. That sort of, you know, attachment to the community that they live in. We can choose to invest in education and um, increase our national productivity uh, and, you know, have a, a rich um, stream of things that we are selling to the world that we have invented or discovered or grown or whatever transformed here. Uh, or we can be, as you said um, earlier, just a, a quarry and a farm. I, I, there's nothing wrong with mining and farming, but wouldn't it be good if we if we Had transformed? Something else. Yeah, well, uh, other things as Eggs if we have basket. other other industries, but also. Like if we're, if we're digging things up here, why aren't we processing them here? One of the reasons, of course, is that energy costs are really high, mm. but we've got un unlimited opportunity for cle cleaner, cheaper, renewable energy that we're not making the most of because we've got a government that is actually ideologically attached to pollution. Like they actually think anything <laughs> you do to reduce pollution is a problem. Um, I like how that's their grand vision, just making sure that like chimney stacks are going. That's that's it seems like that seems to me like what Scott Morrison's vision is to just be like, yeah, a better world. Well, he's the guy that brought a lump of coal into the parliament. You know, like yeah, it's it didn't get soot on his hands either. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how he did that. Now, yeah. anyway, yeah, um, miracle worker, the God he prays to is the right one. But. But like the, 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 these things are all about choices, right? Yeah. Government is all about choices. When, when you are, uh, when you are in government, uh, um, you, you there's a hundred great things that you could do. The skill is picking the the ten most important, best that'll have the biggest impact on people's lives. Uh, yeah, it is insane, isn't it, that they were saying to you, this seemed to be their line the entire time of just like, we can't possibly afford Gonski, which is $30 billion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, They've made decisions just in the past couple of months, like just increase in defence spending of like $270 billion, yeah, right? It, it, it's what, where your priorities lie 
for, 100% for sure. Yeah. Uh, I think the other really good example is in aged care, home and community care, right? There's more than 100,000 people who've been um, assessed as needing and being entitled to home and community care who are waiting on a waiting list, right? And we've got people who are unemployed who could be doing the work, looking after them, but we, we've chosen not to spend the money caring for those old people and employing the people who would look after them. That's a choice the government has made. We make choices like that all the time. In fact, that's kind of what democracy is. Democracy is about choosing the group of people that, that most closely uh, aligns with the sort of choices you would be making if you're in charge of that budget. Don't really get that point. <laughs> but, um, hmm. <laughs> but, All right, okay. I'll, I'm not going to talk to you about democracy then. <laughs> my my, my favourite subject. <laughs> no, but, like, government is all about choices. There yeah, are right, un right, un choices. unlimited sort of things, options that you could make, uh, options you could uh, choose. And what you're trying to do as a voter is, is choose the bunch of people that you think have the closest values to you because they're acting on your behalf to spend the money that the Commonwealth raises yeah, through yes, taxes. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, okay, you're still... You're, no, I'm you're there. Not... I'm there. <laughs> it only took me twice. <laughs> you're a good education shadow <laughs> minister. I'm a, I'm a poor, <laughs> poor communicator, though, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> no, the whole time I've just been learning heaps of stuff. Is it wrong to ask a question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the tough questions to you. The other one... Uh, the other thing that I was just thinking about then is, you know how there's a... Uh, look, look, you heard this a lot as a kid. It seemed like every second 60 Minutes documentary was like, the brain drain, what's happening in Australia about that? But uh, recently, just because I've just been reading into it, basically just so I could say something that sounded kind of smart to you. But <laughs> I've gotten, no, you I've always sound that smart. Much. Don't say, don't say that. You always sound smart. Thank you. <laughs> um, the uh, yeah, she, they, they were talking about uh, all of these basically, and I know scientists that are doing this as well. It's exactly what you're talking about. All of these scientists are basically on the verge of breakthroughs, particularly with uh, sustainable agriculture and renewables. Yeah, that we paid for, like. We paid for their education right up until their PhD. Yeah. And then the Liberals cut the funding going, we shaved, you know, like the, the, the bar was going up here and now it's gone here in terms of saving. And all these people that are talking, they, they, they are at the cutting edge of industries that will be worth trillions of dollars globally over the next few decades. Yeah. And they're leaving. Yeah, well... Do you know, one of the most nuts things is um, a couple of weeks ago, the Liberals announced some changes to university, the, the cost of going to university for students. And they've said, oh, we're going to um, charge people studying STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, math subjects. We're going to charge them less. Uh, because Do you agree we want with that, though? Uh, I, I agree with reducing any cost of going to university. I'd, I'd like to see costs reduced for students right across the board. But the, the there's point is, is that, no, there's two buts here. Two. Uh, there's two buts. Um, the first one is they're they, they say we want to encourage people to study these subjects, mm. but they're cutting jobs in the CSIRO, for example. They're cutting research funding. They're cutting research and development funding. Where are the scientists going to work? Like, Yeah, what, where are they what, going? Pantene Pro-V Institute. What, what kind of... You know, what kind of sense does it make to say we want more people studying these subjects? Oh, but by the way, we're cutting all the funding that supports the jobs that they're currently doing. Uh, and there's, there's... It's weird. It's like a government subsidy for other countries. Well, we do lose a lot of people. I, I mean, I think a lot of people would love to live and work in Australia if they could fund their research here. And, and they try and yeah. they can't. Yeah. No, I hear that story all the time. Mm. And so then they just go to China and make them richer well, because they're doing the smart thing, which is investing in education. And I'm really on board with this 
school's a cool thing that you're trying to sell here. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like, no, it just, it makes a lot of sense that obviously that is where the driving force of the economy is. If you make people smarter, they're gonna come up with little innovations on things because that's what smart people do. And that's what like, and then if you're inventing things, you've got things to sell. And so and like, yeah, it's just like, but like, come on, what is this? What is this like mining out of a quarry thing? Like, Look, there's, there's, it, mining's really important for the Australian economy. I'm not gonna talk down mining. Uh, I'll do and, that, you, and, you, you just and, stick to that. You know, all of these industries make a really important contribution to our economy, but. But education, come on. As if it's not the, the big enchilada Look, of all of it. Here's a really good example. We mine pretty much everything you need to make um, solar batteries here, right? But we, we, don't, we don't use that to make them here. We export them and yeah. then we import them. Yeah, yeah. and all those scientists that were making we, all of those yeah. innovations went to Tesla. Um, so I, I think we could, um, we, could do, uh, we could do the next step of... Uh, a lot of our industries better, you know, the, yeah, the, yeah. that they used to um, advance manufacturing or elab elaborately transformed, um, uh, you know, products. Like uh, anyway, we, we've got we've got three times the we produce three times the amount of food we need to feed ourselves. Uh, it's great when we are actually processing some of that food here and exporting it processed because we get the processing jobs as well as the growing jobs. Mm. Have you read Superpower? Yeah, I have. Yeah. It's good, isn't it? See, this is the whole thing that I'm telling you kids, right? <laughs> she's on the ball. Look, you're not going to read the book, but basically she's just relaying bits from it. But it's, 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 a, it's a great roadmap for Australia's future I'm sick of everybody sitting there going, oh, Labor's not doing enough on climate change. This is what she's talking about right now. She's talking about making Australia a green Saudi Arabia of the future, except for with minus the beheadings for wearing thongs, you know? Like but, but actually, this is, this, is a fan, this is actually a fantastic example of what we're talking about. just the foreign relations. Uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Can you think of another example, maybe? <laughs> 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 and, and, and dip <laughs> diplomatically, we're just moving on from that. Um, <laughs> the the what you're talking about is yeah. we, we've got unlimited sun, unlimited wind, uh, so, you know, good opportunities for hydroelectricity. Uh, we we can be powering a whole lot of manufacturing here in Australia. We're not doing it. We've got... They used to be here as well. Yes. Like it all just got shipped off to Asia because it's just cheap because of the labour costs. But if you have cheaper energy, you can't compete with free. And ch cheaper and cleaner. We've got, a, yes. we've got the p possibility of doing both. Mm. And why we would ignore that, why we would turn our backs on it to invest in new coal-fired power stations like some people in the Liberals. Doing that? There are people in the Liberal and National Parties who want to do that. They want to spend, no, no bank wants to invest in it, no business wants to invest in it. They want to use government money, which actually means taxpayers' money, means your money, to subsidise polluting more expensive forms of energy. It's just nuts. Yeah. Who are these? Oh, well, yeah, they're uh, just <laughs> usual suspects. I'm not going to give them publicity <laughs> by naming them. You won't give them the time of day. We right. used to have a lot of uh, visitors and the children that were here. Tanya used to invite whole class for girls' days. And Classes? Whole class. <laughs> and you used to just cater for everyone, like after school care or something? <laughs> a lot of time, yes. Lots of You're a patient woman, I wouldn't do that. No, I said I, get out. <laughs> Thank you for letting us in your house. I think we should probably say that. It's been maybe four hours or something since you've been here. <laughs> we should probably just get that on the record that we're good guests. Um, but yeah, I guess the other thing is, is there anything else you'd like to add? Oh, no, I mean, I, I don't know. What do you want to ask me about? I'd, I'm happy to talk about anything, <laughs> pretty much anything. I, 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 Pretty much. Yeah, I, I don't know about that. I've got yeah. questions that I probably shouldn't ask. Yeah. Well, but uh, look, if if you uh, if you were in government today, 
what would the first things that you would have done during COVID been in your oh, portfolio? Oh, in education? Um, well, I, I think making sure that where kids were learning from home, they had the resources and the support to do that. It's been really important. Like this is an area where we've seen, again, the huge disparity. People who've got access to the NBN uh, or, you know, decent quality internet were generally doing okay. If they had a device per child, that made all the difference. A lot of families, there was three kids trying to use mum's phone to do their schoolwork. So at times like that, where you've mm. got a real national crisis, mm. the most important thing we could do is make sure that we don't leave anyone behind. More laptops. More laptops, decent internet. Um, yeah. yeah, that'd be good. Yeah. That's a, that's a really important start. And, yeah. And then when kids get back in the classroom, making sure that we pick up if, if kids have missed out on any work, if they've fallen behind for some reason making sure that we help them catch up. And, and that actually means more teachers, tutoring if you need it. it. It actually means investing in those kids individually to, to help them catch up. Mm. One more question, if I may. You know how you had chickens as a kid? Yeah, we did. Yeah, we did, did you have names for them? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well... Oh, people want to know. No, there were many chickens over the years. No, stop avoiding I'm, the tough no, questions. No, you, <laughs> <laughs> unbelievable. Uh, no, Classic we, politician we, shift. <laughs> we, we had chickens that had names. We, we also had a rabbit that um, my dad bought for my niece and nephew and they were little, um, he thought they would like a, you know, soft, fluffy rabbit. It was just this killer rabbit that kept scratching, <laughs> that kept scratching them. It was... What, it attacked it was, the, the chickens? No, the rabbit attacked my niece and nephew. It was a, it was so a, ambitious. It was a, it was a bloodbath. <laughs> <laughs> you don't expect it of rabbits, do you? No, you don't. But then again, no, I, I've, I've had exactly the same experience. It's just like, don't you eat carrots? What, <laughs> why are you so psycho? <laughs> those, those bunnies. <laughs> <laughs> no. Anyway, I guess we've got to let you go because you've, uh, you, you, I don't know, I guess you have like a life. So you should probably, but again, thank you so much for having us in your house. It was really, really nice. And it was you know, nice of you as well to just top off my coffee. Yeah. So thank you. Well, it's a, it's yeah. a pleasure. It's, um, it's actually always nice to be back in the Shire. It is. Yeah. This place is, yeah, I, I love this area. Yeah. It's awesome. Everyone looks like Scott Morrison out there. It's great. Well, anyway. That, that is not true. That is not true. They all have the hat. They all have that hat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, thanks again. Thank you for your time. Oh, it's a, it's a pleasure. Cheers. Please share and comment below. Come in.